Uh, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Jim Stock, and then at around 12.30, 12.35, I'll introduce our second speaker, Megan O'Sullivan. So I'm really excited that we have our colleague Jim Stock here today. Jim is the Vice Provost for Climate and Sustainability at Harvard. Jim is also the Harold Hitchings Burbank Professor of Political Economy in the Department of Economics and here at the Harvard Kennedy School. He's going to provide us with an overview of the Salada Institute for Climate and Sustainability. As Vice Provost, Jim leads the development of a coordinated university-wide strategy. That's not easy, uh, but he's doing an incredible job leading this new university-wide strategy to address climate change and to do so in ways that brings both focus and clarity and visibility to everything that we do here in our research, in our teaching, and in our policy engagement. He's partnering with faculty and researchers, students and staff to be able to bring all the disciplines and the strengths across the entire university to tackle climate change challenges. Jim has a long and impressive career conducting research. He's a macroeconomist, conducting econometrics, and he caught, I would say, over the past decade or more, the climate bug, if you will, and has been doing a lot of research in the energy and climate space over that time. Some of that informed by his time when he served as a member of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors in 2013 and 2014. So Jim will open with a few remarks about the Salada Institute, and then we'll take questions from you, and we'll have a discussion about that. And then around 12.30, 12.35, we will then transition to the talk by Megan O'Sullivan. Jim, welcome back to the Energy Policy Center. Thanks, Joe. It's uh, it's great to be uh, it's great to be back here, and uh, you know Joe mentions that I guess I got the energy climate bug ten years ago. Actually, the reason I decided to go to graduate school in economics was I was a physics major as an undergraduate. The reason I decided to go to graduate school in economics is I wanted to be an energy economist, but uh, then I showed up and I don't know I got distracted and did econometrics and. Whatever, uh, but uh, fortunately, was able to uh, transition back to my roots over the, and and actually, to be fair, Joe, I actually have been working on this for about 20 years. Although much of that was in, um, sort of in the science domain, so econometrics of the science side rather than serious economics. So you know, I guess I would say, um, I, I just want to step back and say one thing, which is that we're really in a remarkable moment, a remarkable moment in so many different ways right now. But uh, if we just look at it within a remarkable and troubling in so many different ways, but if we just look at it from a, a, a climate energy perspective, the past year has been um, has been astounding, and I think we've seen we've seen tremendous tremendous changes. I mean, first of all, I guess the last couple of years, uh, it's really I, I, it's really completely evident that the problems of climate change are not something that's happening in the future, but some thing problems that are happening right now. If you think about the Temperatures in South Asia. You think about last, the previous summer's heat wave in Portland. You think about the drying out of the Colorado River. You think about the various floods. You think about the floods in Pakistan. So it, you know it's clear that the problems of climate change are not something that's going to be happening down the road, but they're happening right now. And I think, for you know, I think that's sort of been a, a surprise, but it's also been really uh, transformative in terms of how this is just part of our everyday everyday conversation and everyday understanding. I think in the United States, it's been a remarkable, it's been a remarkable summer uh, with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. And I know that uh, at least one of the speakers on Joe's list later in the semester was deeply involved in some of the modeling. And I'm looking forward to hearing from, from him. He's at, he's at Rhodes right now. Uh, maybe there's others too, but, uh, but he's a, at least that's one of them. And uh, that, I mean, that's actually a really important piece of legislation as probably everybody in this room knows, something that's going to be moving us uh, forward in the United States in a significant way. Um, it's not the end of the story by any stretch of the imagination, but at least it's, it's a very significant uh, step that we really needed to, really needed to make. Uh, and, and then, you know, at a more micro level, it is spectacular, it's a spectacularly important that California has done an ICE ban for 2035. I mean, that is really, uh, a really, a, it's a huge deal. So I've done a fair amount of modeling of 
the, uh, of the energy transition, of, of the EV transition. And the end game of how that actually plays out is really unclear. It's now clear, uh, at least for California. I think that's a really, it's, it's, you, you can't understate how important that, how important that decision has been. Um, at the same time, we have, you know, at the same time, there's so many problems that are, if anything, even getting worse. I'm sure many of you, you know, read the most recent depressing news about maybe are getting another uh, foot from uh, Greenland that we hadn't really expected. Uh, so, um, you know, so there's much, much that we need to do, much that we need to be doing on the mitigation front and much that we need to be doing on the adaptation front, and some would argue on other fronts as well. So that gets to the question of like, well, okay, uh, this is not, this is, there's reasons for think that, to think that we're really making important transitions. Oh, and I guess I should just mention in this litany what Megan is going to be talking about, which of course is the war in Ukraine, which she will, you know, a year ago in her foreign affairs piece with Jacob, uh, Jason Bordoff, uh, before the war in Ukraine, they were arguing how actually instead of a happy, uh, slow, period of federal states fading into oblivion, what we're really going to see is geo, cri geo crises one after another and how prescient they were in terms of, uh, in terms of this geo crisis. Of course, not solely because of Rus Russia's fading federal state status, but potentially in part because of that. So with all of these upheavals and all of these transitions, it's clear that we've made progress, but there's far, far, far more that needs to be done, which raises the question, of how can universities make a difference? How can universities do more than what they've done? And more importantly, what from more more immediately, what can Harvard do that's beyond what it has been doing so far? So Harvard has a lot of great experts. We've got Joe Aldi. We've got some of the other people in this room. We've got some of the other people at the Kennedy School and across the university. They're terrific. They're making really important um, contributions within their area. We as a system, we as universities collectively, we as a society need to be doing more. What can Harvard be doing more than what we're already doing? Um, let me just, so so a year ago, uh, the president created a new position, vice provost for climate sustainability, asked me if I would do it. Uh, I said, okay. <laughs> uh, um, I don't know what I, whether I really knew what I was getting myself into. But, uh, but, you know, I guess why did the reason I, the reason I chose to do this is, you know, I've been interested in climate. I worked in the Obama administration, really focused on making significant progress, sort of worked on trying to make the IRA and the Build Back Better, more effective legislation. So, I, I mean, I'm deeply engaged in this, and this seemed like an opportunity for me to be able to try to get Harvard to make even more of a contribution than it actually already is. Okay. So how do we do that? So we were really fortunate in June to be able to announce a gift for the Salati Institute on Climate and Sustainability, funded very generously by a $200 million um, endowment grant, a gift uh, by uh, Jean and Melanie Salata. So that provides us with a framework for going and doing a lot more. What does more mean? Well, I mean, what does Harvard do? Harvard does research, Harvard does education, and I think really importantly, Harvard can do in this particular area a lot more engagement, a lot more outreach, a lot more convening, a lot more being an, a trusted a trusted source of information in this world of disinformation, and a trusted platform that can help people reach practical climate solutions. When I say practical climate solutions, you know, that can happen across all different scopes. Can, Think about the problem of climate migration. An enormous, I, I actually worry that one of the big problems we're going to be facing globally, uh, along with the petrostates issues that Megan is going to talk about, is the political challenges that are going to be forced upon us by climate migration as parts of the parts become uninhabitable, parts of the world become uninhabitable, either because of flooding or because of sea level rise or because of uh, heat waves and droughts. So, you know, how are we going to manage that? How are we going to manage those pressures? It's clear that we as society, we've been, we have had minor migration problems in the United States or pressures in the United States, and we've been really bad. It's caused huge distress within our political system, and that's just the beginning, and that's just, you know, the United States. So this is going to be a major challenge. Uh, Germany's experienced, the Europe has experienced its own climate, its own migration problems. This is going to get worse. How are we going to tackle that? How can Harvard help to understand the issues, to bring together the various parties, to recognize that this is going to happen? What can we do to prepare for it happening and to mitigate its challenges 
and to see what you know, see what can be done. So that's a huge question, but it's the sort of question that spans all of what Harvard is good at, all of the sciences and all of the businesses and all of the legal situation and all of the public policy people. So it expands all of the areas that Harvard can really uh, participate in. So research, education, and uh, engagement. And I think that this is th that's the, the three legs that the Salata Institute is going to be uh, built on. In terms of the education, we actually set up an education committee uh, last spring. We had faculty and administrators from across the schools. And the question is like, what do we need to be doing more? So there's opportunities for students to provide input to the committee. What should we be doing in terms of our education? Should we be teaching this more? Should we have this program change? No, those sorts of things. Uh, that's a, a lot of a lift. There's a lot of work to do across the whole university. So we're gonna be making progress on that uh, with the working with the schools because ultimately the education occurs in the schools, but we can support a lot of those changes too. Um, one of the things that we really want to do um, also uh, is to pull on the strengths of the various parts of the Harvard community. So, uh, so far I've been talking about fairly faculty-centric things like faculty research programs and then the labs and then the research assistants. So faculty-centered uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, research. And when I talk about education, it's kind of top you know, it's like we're going to teach some more courses, we might have some more programs for the students, but it's sort of, again, sort of looking at it from the services we provide. But an important part of what we want to do is actually recognize that there is an incredible amount of wisdom and expertise and commitment and passion from a bunch of communities that really need to be engaged uh, in a very constructive and direct way more than they have been engaged so far at Harvard. One of those is the students. The students are incredibly knowledgeable and deeply committed and, uh, and so there's a question of how to engage the students and how, what's the right way to do that. I'm gonna ask you for input. Um, a second group is the alumni. So we've been involved with discussions with alumni. The alumni really passionately want to move, uh, help Marburg move forward, help with education, help with mentoring, help with <laughs> job placement. Uh, things along those lines. And so we're gonna be figuring out ways to harness the uh, uh, alumni enthusiasm and then also do our education. They also would like to have some educational activities and educational programs. So we're gonna help with that. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to come back to this question, the first question I raised, which is we have a, a fair number of students in the audience. Um, and I guess I'm especially interested in hearing from the students. We have a few minutes of Q and A. Uh, I, I'm especially interested in hearing from the students about opportunities that they would see for the Salata Institute and how can the Salata Institute support activities that the students are interested in? What is it that we should, what is it that we should be doing? And so I'm saying this actually in completely good faith because we have, like, remember the gift was announced in June. So it was not like we've got a building and a staff of 40 people and a dozen programs. Like it was announced in June. So we're building this thing as we speak, and now is a great time to get uh, to get input. So the floor is open. I can hold this. Oh, for those online. Um, I was just talking about the different kind of silos that we have at Harvard, which are really helpful in, in moving things forward effectively. Um, but in terms of having a university-wide center that you know, is disruptive in, in how we do collaboration, um, for me, I think that would be incredibly important and not as much as we need targeted programs for each audience. Finding a way um, to break through probably that student and research and you know who's who and how do they contribute? So I'd be interested in, yeah, seeing how that may play a, a role in implementation. It's incredibly important. So I love the word. I love the word disruptive. Uh, it's actually a, a better word. I, I prefer that word to coordinate because like coordinate is impossible at Harvard. But <laughs> uh, but maybe we can be annoyed and we can actually try to help disrupt things. So I think I, I so I've been a faculty member here for about 120 years. So 
so I can, I sort of have a pretty, a, a sense of, as to how we might want to do that in the research thing. We're setting up research, what I'm calling research clusters, which are going to be cross school entities. They're going to be working on a specific problem. Like the climate situation could be an example. You know, other things could be an example, but a big problem, but a problem that still is, you can wrap your head around. Um, I think that the faculty, I'm going to only talk about this from a faculty perspective. I think the faculty realize they've made lots of contributions. They're leaders in their fields, but they still haven't had the impact that they would like to have. This is like a big problem. We all want to make impact in the way that we can on this problem, and they're going to be more effective in that if they collaborate with people across the school. We can provide the funding for that. We can provide the space that actually gets them to interact with each other and to interact with the other teams. And when we can provide the Harvard platform and the Harvard name to lift up their work and to engage external entities so that they can actually be more impactful than they would be if they just hung out at the business school, or they just hung out at the Kennedy School, or they just hung out in some science lab on the campus. How we do that around, how do we do that around students? So that's going to be a question. That's a question. How do we, how, what can we do to be disruptive in the student space so that we can actually get the, Get 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 Kennedy School and you know business school and Ed School students who are all deeply concerned about climate. You know how can we lift that up? So that's a question. I don't want to give any. I mean, we can make up answers, but actually, I want to hear some answers. Perfect. Um, next. Yeah. Oh. May I? Thank you, Professor. Uh, that was very enlightening. Uh, you mentioned there are three focus areas, uh, research, education, and engagement. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on engagement? Is it engagement with the communities within Harvard, with public, with governments? Yeah, okay, that's great. Thank you for the clarification. So um, the, the answer is going to be all of the above, but most in, in particular, what I was thinking about is engaging with the external, let's call it the external climate professional community or the, the community that's going to be making uh, changes in how we do things in specific areas. Okay, so I, I'm going to go through made up examples. S suppose that we're working on, uh, suppose that we're working on, um, on uh, offsets. Just, I'm making this up. Uh, suppose that we're working on offsets you could imagine having researchers going and studying offsets and then doing something about carbon, carbon nature-based solutions and then doing you know something else and then you publish a few papers and then you move on to the next project. That's fine, that's fine, but that's not gonna make a difference. The only way that's gonna make a difference is if they then are actively, actively engaged talking to series, talking to the various offset rating agencies, talking to Mark Carney's commission, Mark Carney's on the Board of Overseers at Harvard. So we have the ability to convene everybody so that that work, I, again, I'm making this up on offsets, that work on offsets would not just be, let's throw it into some academic publication and then we go and do something else or we have an academic conference and the professors talk to each other, but actually let's make a difference so that we come up with the standards, we help the world inform how we do that. We're not going to be able to say, oh, Harvard's got its standards. The world helps us and we help them come to solving the practical problems that they need to solve so that we have clear understandings about the role of offsets, clear understandings about the role of offsets in achieving corporate targets. I'm, I'm sort of making that up and winging it. That may or may not be an example that we actually would follow up on, but that's the difference. But it's a difference and that's the, and that is, and Harvard has that potential almost uniquely to do that sort of engagement at national and international level. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Um, thanks so much, Professor Stock. I'm Charles. I'm a senior at the college, also Hi. on the Presidential Committee on Sustainability. Um, so the Biden administration talks a lot about sort of the whole of government approach to climate. And similarly, at the university, um, it might make sense to have sort of a whole of university approach. I'm curious the extent to which the Slada Institute will engage with 
um, sort of under uh, appreciated aspects of the student experience from you know the admissions office to the athletics um, department and, and engaging some of these sort of non-traditional partners um, in creating a new sort of culture around uh, engagement with climate and sustainability. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think I think that's a completely appropriate question. I have no problem. I mean, I think that that would be an appropriate thing to do. You know, one thing you mentioned the athletic department. One thing that I was really surprised by and very heartened by was in this education committee that wrapped up with this reports coming out pretty soon. The, I think they did a you know token outreach to the athletic department, and we had sort of expected that they wouldn't even reply, but they were actually really interested. They actually really wanted to be engaged in dealing with climate solutions, and that was like fantastic. That's great. So I suspect that there's it's a, it that this will be our figuring out how to push on open doors and 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 get that engagement and involvement. So I, 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 I agree with the spirit of what you're saying. I think I see, I see the real speaker here who's gonna talk about stuff that is like super interesting and only a little bit scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna segue from sort of climate challenges to something depressing. <laughs> All right. No, no, no. Actually, I'm after my, I was only supposed to talk till 12.30. So I actually, you're the, you're the main attraction. We are delighted to have our colleague, Megan O'Sullivan, who uh, has uh, served in the White House and has uh, made really significant intellectual contributions. Most recently, if you listen to any podcast like Foreign Affairs or anything, you heard Megan and Jason doing their book, to Jess and Jason board off of Columbia, doing the book tour. One thing I will say, which is, you know, when I step back, when I initially introduced this, I said how universities need to do more collectively. One of the things that universities need to do more collectively is working together. I think, you know, it's very easy to think of like, oh, we're fighting Columbia, but we're not. The reality is we're all on the same team on this problem. So it's really great that Stanford's starting its door school. It's really great that Columbia is doing the climate, the School of Climate. It's really great that, Colum that Jason Bordoff, who's one of their deans, and Megan are doing this joint work. And as long as we get a little bit of credit, we're good. Okay. <laughs> So it's interesting, um, Jason Bordoff and I, we're not doing a book tour, we're doing like a pre-book tour. We're going to be writing a book on a lot of things we've been writing and talking about, but someone called us the um, the John Lennon and Paul McCartney of energy wonk wonkery. And so now we're having a big argument over who's McCartney and who's Lennon. Um, so anyway, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here and thrilled to be following Jim and of course I, We'll look forward to hearing about your conversation about the uh, the work that Harvard is doing and is going to be doing around climate, which is such an important issue. Um, I'm here to talk to you about what I've been thinking about and in the hope that I can um, harvest some of your good ideas as well as try to convey some of the things I've been thinking about. And as I prepared for this, my mind went to Berlin in 2017 where I, was in Berlin to present a paper on a topic that wasn't really at the forefront of a lot of people's mind at the time. I had just finished um, writing a book on the geopolitics of the unconventional oil and gas boom and, and how that change in energy technology had a role in, in reshaping global politics. And so I just finished that book and I had turned my mind to start asking a question about, well, not how can we get the energy transition to move more quickly, um, but what are some of the unintended consequences that we may find ourselves on if we actually, if and when we are successful in transitioning to a, a net zero economy? Although I, I don't think I was using those exact uh, words in 2017, but that was my thought. What are the consequences of success? I was surprised at how my paper was received. Um, and I think the best word would be hostility. Um, I didn't expect that, but my German colleagues and other Europeans who were there for this workshop really saw what I was presenting 
as an effort to discredit the need to transition away from fossil fuels. And you know, when I thought about it in retrospect, it's not that one of the big arguments for a climate transition was that it's going to you know, be good for geopolitics, but certainly there was the expectation that an energy transition would kind of vanquish the, the you know, horrible politics of oil and gas. And that was part and parcel of some of the appeal of the energy transition. I was actually not making any kind of normative statement. I was simply adopting a framework that when you have a big change in the energy system, you should expect a big change in geopolitics. And I still stand by that. And I would say that you know a lot has changed since uh, March 2017. I think there's one been the appreciation that project that I worked on with many of my students. Um, that project was about the geopolitics of renewables. Now we talk about something more complicated, recognizing that renewables will not be in themselves sufficient, that we have to have all kinds of low carbon or zero carbon energy sources. Um, I think we've also come to understand and appreciate that the geopolitics of net zero are going to involve energy geopolitics. They're gonna be different, but they're still gonna be present. And certainly the conversation that has really jumped to the, the fore um, on around critical minerals is an example of that. You know, Just understanding how critical minerals has a heavy geopolitical component and is also so critical for the energy transition. And then finally, I think there is now an appreciation that we're not going to see like an incremental passage of the politics of oil and gas to be gradually replaced by the politics of clean energy, that we're actually seeing these two things layered on top of each other. So we have both of these geopolitics going on at the same time, which is complicated for, um, for, the, uh, for the energy transition and for the global landscape. Now, I see some of my former students in the class, and you'll remember that I always say, you have to be prepared to brief without your slides. So here I am briefing without my slides because we can't get slides in this room, but that's okay. So um, this is why it is going to be a little bit depressing, but hopefully we'll find an upbeat note. What I want to do is tell you about where my thinking and writing is today and bring together two grants. On the one hand, I'm spending a lot of time on this question, how is the energy transition going to shape geopolitics? Um, and again, we think a lot about um, you know, how to get to net zero, but I really am thinking more about how the effort to get there, not the end state, but actually the decades in between now and say 2050, how the, the steps that governments, institutions, businesses, nonprofits, individuals, how those steps are going to shape geopolitics. The effort to get to net zero is going to create all kinds of actions. In my mind, it is going to make the energy transition the greatest geopolitical risk of the coming decades. You know, we have seen already in this century, 22 years, we've seen two big geopolitical resets, the pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war. I think the energy transition in terms of just its geopolitical remaking is going to, um, sh you know, overwhelm those other two geopolitical resets because we're talking about rebuilding the framework of the global economy and doing it in a short period of time. And that's going to transform geopolitics. And then the other piece is really how geopolitics are shaping the energy transition. So we spend a lot of time, understandably and appropriately here, talking about technology and policy and how they're going to shape the energy transition, and make new things possible. And I really want us to integrate geopolitics into that, to make it a third leg of that school. So we talk about technology, politics, technology, policy, and geopolitics. We are um, in, I would say, the most perilous geopolitical moment since the end of World War II. And as such, how can we think that we are going to be able to reshape the backbone of the global economy, the energy system, without, you know, without really thinking about how it's going to play out in this geopolitical moment? So that's why I'm afraid it's a little depressing because the argument I want to make today is that both of these things, the energy transition and the geopolitical landscape are uh, have reinforcing dynamics. They're reinforcing one another and contributing, this is the depressing part, to a downward spiral that brings us to a more dangerous world and a world in which it's harder to meet our climate ambitions. Now, the part that's not depressing is the part you're all going to help me with that I'm still working on. It's like, well, what can we do about it? But we'll get there. Okay, so there are just for the uh, sake of being structured, um, 
there are, I would say, five areas in my head, these are not perfectly distinct, five areas where I see this reinforcing thing, where energy and geopolitics are in this cycle. And my slide, which I spend a lot of time doing this, had this lovely, like, circle, circular thing, but you, you get the idea, because it's not very complicated. Okay, so the first is, the first of these five areas, I would call weakening globalization. And so there's a lot of talk about globalization, deglobalization, reglobalization, regionalization. Um, I think there's some, you know, debate about this that's legitimate, legitimate, some misunderstanding. I think it's fair to say, or at least how I have found it useful to think about it is, we're in a world of escalating global forces. Um, we think about the pandemic, we think about climate change, even capital flows. There's still, there's a lot that's happening that is global but we're in a period of weakening governance of those global forces. Think about the pandemic, okay? There's a global, there's something that really united the world, but really um, a very deficient global governance strategy to address it. So I think we can call it whatever we want, but I, my starting point is we are in this, in this world um, where there are weakening ties between states, the integration, the interdependence um, that has been really, you know, on steroids since the 1970s um, is moving in the opposite direction. So that's my starting point. Um, and I would say a lot of those drivers are geopolitical drivers. We've got the U.S.-China relationship. We have the pandemic. We have polarization of domestic politics in this country and in other countries that cause uh, countries to turn inward. And again, I would say the energy transition both is affected by this and it reinforces deglobalization. So it's affected by it because of supply chains. I mean, this is the best example, not the only one, but supply chains. So think about how deglobalization is really, um, and you know, th this move away from interdependence is creating a lot of strains and stresses around what the clean energy supply chain is going to look like and how it's going to get more complicated and potentially um, become actually a, a, a blockage or a, a break on how quickly we can move to electric vehicles or the energy transition. In terms of how the energy transition is reinforcing of deglobalization or whatever we want to call it, I would say here that there's pushes and pulls to the energy transition, but on the whole, and this is a hypothesis, which I'd love people to pick apart, on the whole, my sense is the energy transition is going to be more deglobalizing than it is globalizing. And that is in part because, you know, if you think about it, the easiest way to decarbonize many sectors is to electrify them. And electricity is more likely to be generated nationally than it is to be generated uh, or passed across borders. Uh, if we look at the statistics in 2018, only 3% of the world's electricity crossed borders, where in 2014, we had two thirds of oil and gas crossing borders. So if we're really a much more electrified global economy, it's more likely that we will be, um, we will be meeting energy needs from a regional or self-sufficiency basis. Um, and that's kind of borne out if you look at the IEA and you look at their net zero report, they say that energy trade in 2050 will be only 38% of what it would be if we just stayed on today's current trajectory. Um, and actually half of that energy trade will be in critical minerals. So we're talking about how the energy transition again is going to be contributing to this phenomenon of deglobalization. So that's my first kind of hypothesis. My second area of reinforcement um, is what I'm calling kind of uh, growing dominance of politics over economics. And this I borrowed from my friend Fareed Zakaria with the appreciation that it might be like, it might be a, a little too high level to be really practical, but I think it, it helps um, define what I'm trying to think about here. So in some ways, um, this is not true for every part of the world, but in many parts of the world, we can look around and we could see how politics is trumping economics in national decision making. So if we look at China and we look at President Xi Jinping and we think about how his, you know, his drive for economic reform has really taken a backseat to 
to his drive for political consolidation and his perception that more economic reform would actually be the greatest challenge to the survival of the Chinese Communist Party. So the politics have definitely trumped economics there. We look at Russia, and um, it's hard to know exactly what's in the mind of Putin, but clearly, you know, Putin's willing to bear some pretty high economic costs in pursuit of his strategic goal of defanging what he perceived to be a threat in Ukraine, but also to resetting the European security order. If we think about other places, even the Europeans, look at how they're dealing with the energy crisis. Um, a lot of this has to do with, okay, we're going to try to diminish political, potential political blowback. We're talking today in Europe about a price cap on uh, the price of, of gas. We've seen how uh, there's been huge subsidies to try to keep down prices so that consumers don't bear the cost. And I just got back from 10 days in Europe, and a lot of this has to do with like being nervous about the political backlash. Um, and even in the US, the Biden administration, one of their big foreign policy goals is to define and execute a foreign policy for the middle class. And that is, you know, we can, that's a, it's a little bit nebulous, but essentially that has translated into an American foreign policy that has no trade policy component. We can go into that, but that is, you know, that is a reflection of politics trumping economics. So what does this mean for the energy transition? Um, I think this affects how, how successful the energy transition might be or the pace at which it might go. Think about India levying a lot of, uh, tariffs on Chinese solar panels and other things in order to try to focus on building up a domestic uh, base for its renewable energy industry. Look at the um, United States and the Inflation Reduction Act about how you can get all these uh, tax credits um, if you make things in the United States. But I think even more interestingly, we have decided to approach the energy transition by basically you know, giving a hand to decades of economist wisdom about the need to put a price on carbon. And instead we're saying, no, we can get there by just incentivizing everything. So again, I would say, and this was because this was the way to get political consensus around these programs. So again, another example of how politics may be trumping economics and how that plays into the energy transition. Okay, thirdly, uh, intensifying great power competition. I don't think I have to belabor this point, but after a respite of you know, several decades after the end of the Cold War, um, we're now in a place which I think, as I'm a, uh, originally a foreign policy person, still consider myself one, you know, we are in a period where I think uh, the prospect of great power competition or the reality of it would have been inconceivable to imagine 10 years ago. I mean, literally the United States is in a position where it is somewhat in a proxy war with Russia, depending on how you perceive it, and seriously looking at the prospect, hopefully not materialized, but the potential for a conflict with China over Taiwan. So at the same time, you know, in a few short years, we've gone from um, what one person has called a holiday from history to a point that is more consistent with the trajectory of the last many uh, centuries, which is that there is great power competition, and that is shaping the international arena. What does that mean for the energy transition? Again, this kind of reinforcing idea. So it affects the energy transition because the great power competition is really undermining institutions that we might look to to try to help us address this problem. So again, I don't want to be a downer, but if I think about COP27 and I think about what the expectations might be around COP27, I think they pale in comparison for what we might hope for if the US and China were in a different dynamic right now. In terms of how the energy transition might be reinforcing great power competition. I think there's also a, a component of that. And I think the best example here is looking at, at the situation with Russia. And that actually this disorderly energy transition that we're currently in has added tinder to the great power competition fire, if that's the right way to say it. Um, and, and that's in some ways that uh, I, I think if, if any of you have been listening to Fatih Barol, he's talking about very explicitly how this energy crisis is not because of the clean energy transition. And I want to be clear that that's not what I'm saying either. But what I am saying is that the 
energy transition, because it has been disorderly in the sense that there hasn't been, you know, that we, we've had a mismatch of supply and demand for different energy sources, that empowered President Putin to actually exert more geopolitical leverage. So essentially, where we moved into this period where we have continuing increases in demand for oil and gas, yet really, you know, declining or flat investment in oil and gas, that created a mismatch that gave Putin a lot of geopolitical power at that moment. And I think we should expect to see that going forward, that we will have mismatches between supply and demand, and that will empower traditional producers of oil and gas. Um, and that will, you know, increase the prospects of the great power competition that I'm talking about. Fourthly, okay, um, another uh, geopolitical component is the, the deteriorating relationship between the developing world and the developed world. See, up until recently, although um, you could argue about this, but you know, there was a sense of convergence that when the developed world grew, this was beneficial for the developing world, and that there were you know, broad trajectories where the, the two were growing in tandem together. Now we're potentially at a different point in time. I see uh, Professor Hausman back there, so he can correct me in my, my thoughts here. But we're potentially at a different time where the developing world, or many countries in the developing world, again, I'm making big generalizations when I talk about the global order, but um, is facing a difficult period post-COVID when it comes to major debt burdens, uh, potential food crisis on the way, inflation and energy. And this, of course, affects the energy transition because I think it does make it harder to get the developing world on board with the idea of net zero 2050. It's interesting, in my travels this summer, I didn't travel to developing world, I was in Europe a bit, but met with many people there. I was surprised by how many people um, wanted to make the point that the developed world should not think that the developing world has bought into the whole concept of net zero 2050. I thought that was interesting. I'd be interested to hear other people's perception. So that obviously affects the energy transition. How does the energy transition perhaps reinforce this dynamic? Well, because of the, the current um, insufficiency of the developed world's response to try to help the developing world in meeting the challenges of net zero. So we're all familiar with the $100 billion a year that was supposed to materialize by 2020. But I think there, there are other um, ways in which the frustration among the developing world is building. And I expect that will be one of the themes that we'll see coming out of COP27. So lastly, the last of my fifth dynamics of the reinforcing geopolitics and energy transition loop um, has to do with the growing power of the state. So um, for all of you who were uh, reading newspapers and things in the 1990s, um, the expectation was that going forward, we were going to see a world where non-state actors were going to be more dominant, supranational entities were going to be more dominant, and there was a decline, a sense of a decline of the nation state as a, a geopolitical actor. Um, this, the opposite has actually happened. We're in a period now where we have the strengthening of the state, again, a generalization, but true for a lot of important actors. Um, this is true if we look at China, we think about India, Mexico, Turkey, um, a lot of places, um, I would say we see a strengthening state, um, it, particularly in relationship to, to some other, um, like the supranational actors. And I think the energy transition reinforces this because the energy transition is going to require a stronger state to be able to get to where climate ambitions can be met. Um, that there's an appreciation, I think, by many that the market can't take us to where we need to be in the time frame we need to be, and therefore the government will need to play more of a role. And I think now, just in the last six months, when we have the Russia component and we have energy security really coming to the center of this conversation at the same time, there's the appreciation that there's this very difficult role that the government is going to have to play. Again, this was a part of many of my practical conversations over the last several weeks. We have government society saying, we need more natural gas in particular in the short term. Um, but we still want to, we actually want to accelerate our efforts to get to net zero. And so a lot of the actors who should be building that 
infrastructure are private sector actors. And they're saying, how are we supposed to respond to, we didn't love you yesterday, we love you a lot today, but we promise you we're not gonna love you tomorrow. Um, so please build. And a lot of these actors are saying like, what is the argument for us to make these investments? And so again, there's a role here for more creative policymaking for what we might talk about as transition assets. Okay, so let me wrap up and this is where I hope we'll move to something that might be a little bit more positive and interesting. I realize this is a dim view of the world. There are, um, you know, if, if we had longer, there are certainly mitigating factors. But I wanna ask the question, okay, if we, if we generally um, think that this is potentially true, that essentially we're in a world where the geopolitical landscape is very fraught, more so than at any other time in decades, um, and that that geopolitical landscape is influencing our ability to move ahead on the energy transition, and the energy transition is reinforcing some of these geopolitical dynamics in a negative way. Okay, what should we do about it? So what? Um, I think the conventional response that you know I have heard or get so far is people say like, well, we have to improve geopolitical relations. You know, we have to have a better relationship with China. Like, I am a hundred percent all for a better relationship with China. Um, having spoken to many people in our governments who've been trying to build a better relationship, I no longer um, put stock in like that is the answer to the conundrum that I have outlined here. I think what it is is you know we need to continue to try to improve our relationship there. I think there's all kinds of you know, possibilities that things could change on the margins and be open to a breakthrough, but that is not, you know, that is not sufficient to address the dynamics I'm talking about. Secondly, you know, if we were really down in the dumps, we would say, okay, we just need to prepare for a very disorderly transition or even potentially not meeting our climate goals. Like if these, if these cycles are so reinforcing and so hard to break, um, where are we? Um, I also feel like that is insufficient for obvious reasons. And then the third piece, which is what I'm trying to um, think more about um, and would love people today or later to help me think about this is, I think we need to think differently about how we're approaching the energy transition. I think we need to evaluate tools and options differently. We talk a lot about the gap between ambition and reality when we talk about climate change. In fact, Jason Bordoff, my colleague I mentioned at the beginning, this is one of his favorite points, which is like, we have a big gap right now between where we wanna be in terms of climate and where we are. To me, a new meaning for this ambition reality gap is that we continue to think that we can solve this global problem relying on cooperative mechanisms in a geopolitical environment that is deeply fragmented and fragmented. So that's like the reality that we have to come to terms with. And the question is again, do we, um, can we think about the transition differently if we are going to assume that we're not in a cooperative environment? But if we assume that we're in a geopolitical environment with a lot of tension and a lot of competition, you know, is there a way to turn heightened geopolitical great power competition to our advantage? Can we, you know, can we harness that competition to advance the energy transition rather than work against it? Are there energy sources that we should be evaluating, um, not solely in light of geopolitics, but with an eye to geopolitics? You know, I am struck by all the um, excitement about hydrogen that one thing that you know is is interesting but doesn't come up very much is that's one of the new energy sources where the supply chain does not go through China right now and so if you're a US policymaker like maybe that is is an interesting point again in the stool of policy technology and geopolitics um, and you know are there certain kinds of policy prescriptions that maybe we're not hugely enthusiastic about because we are, grounded in the hope um, that we are going to be in a cooperative environment that might actually, some of their downsides might seem less uh, negative if we are looking at the international landscape of one that is going to be inherently competitive and potentially conflictual. And so again, um, I throw this out knowing that some people in this uh, room will have thought more about this than I, but like the idea of climate clubs that we've heard a lot about. Like one of the downsides of that is, you know, that could end up being, you know, bifurcating the world and 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 putting people, pitching people against one another in a geopolitical 
um, environment, if, if we're already there or we can't expect to be otherwise, you know, does that, you know, does that prescription actually offer more um, to our problem than we originally thought? So with that, I, I am rarely to the minute, but I am actually, it's exactly one o'clock. I know if some people have classes and things, so I know people have to leave and I will not take it personally, um, but I would love to hear thoughts or try to answer questions. But as you can tell, this is still very much a work in progress. It sounded even more depressing than I anticipated, which is not my goal. It, it's, it, it, you know, I really do want to see if we can get people to think a different way and what it would look like. Wonderful. Uh, yes. What do you think, um, Joe, of, if I try to take a, a number of questions, number of questions and then and then okay, because I, I really am interested to hear, and they don't have to be all questions again; they can be thoughts. Um, so, yes. Hello. Hi, Professor. Good to see you again. Um, so if you could just um, everybody just say who they are. I know who you are, but um, <laughs> others may not. Yes, uh, my name is Marina Lorenzini. I work at the project on managing the atom at the Belfer Center. Um, my question focuses on um, you mentioned that. You were in Europe uh, for the past few weeks, and um, I'm curious about how your European colleagues kind of looked at nuclear power across Europe. Um, on one hand, there's great interest um, because Europe is dependent on gas and looking to find indigenous sources. But on the other hand, the situation at the Zaporizhia power plant makes nuclear power look really untenable. Um, and so I'm just curious, based on your observations, um, how are you seeing that risk reward calculus develop? Thank you. Great, thank you very much. If you could pass it to your colleague. Hello, my name is Aus. I'm from the MPID. I just wanted to think about the, I, want, I have an idea and I would love your thoughts on it. If we, we're in a world of geopolitics and a lot of tension, can't we just reframe the energy problem as an, a problem of independence and sovereignty? Uh, that, that we nudge countries and states to, to develop their renewable energy in, in the premise that this is the way you break away from the, the new, the, the order where, where a war in Ukraine would affect everyone. So Europe, China, or the US would, would invest in a future where their sovereignty is related to, to energy independence and thus renewable energy. Okay, great, thank you. I'm gonna take a bunch of questions, but I look forward to responding to that. Yeah, if we could pass, the, just keep passing the microphone up, that would be great. And then I'll get to the person in the back as well. Great. Hi there, Kyle, he, him, uh, MPP1. I just wanted to kind of tie together a little bit that goes with the first half and the second half, which is engagement of Indigenous Americans and maybe even international Indigenous people, because there is a difference in the way that they are approaching the understanding of this climate change challenge. It's something, you know, we're talking about stewardship of the land for tens of thousands of years prior to the American government. And I think if we're looking for creativity and solutions, we need to be more than just a think tank, which we have the opportunity to do here. And I think it'd be a really good opportunity for Harvard to take. Great, thanks, Kyle. Um, keep passing it forward. Hello, um, Alex Clark, visiting from Oxford University. It's great to see Hi. you again. Um, can't believe it's been five years since that paper. And I didn't know it was so controversial, so it's you know, curious. I actually had someone come up to me in Oslo just a week ago to reminisce about it. So, oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I have a list of questions and points as long as my arm, but I'll try and be really succinct. Um, so I think implicit in the points that you were making was um, critical resources, critical minerals, of which uh, obviously China has uh, dominance over supply chains for most of them, and there are security assessments in the US that, that show this very clearly, not just on the raw materials, but also on the finished products, many of which are needed for wind, solar, transmission networks, the whole the whole thing, and, and the hydrogen industry as well. Um, so I just wanted to ask your, your thoughts on that particular issue. Uh, and then on the growing power of the state, um, it's interesting that some there's been some serious reassessment of the economics of renewable energy, particularly how the cost of wind and solar declines over time as you deploy more of it, um, to the point that um, there's a big argument going on between heter heterodox and orthodox economists over this. But it's starting to look as though more state activism might actually be totally in line with, um, with the economics of, uh, of deploying uh, immature technologies. And then thirdly, um, 
on the EU and the African Union in particular, this is a really clear example of, I think, what you're describing, the schism between the developing and developed world. Um, insofar as the EU has had a lot of opportunities this year um, through von der Leyen's um, kind of new big announcements, Global Gateway Initiative and so on, to reset relations with the African Union and with some of its particular member states that seems to be completely missed um, to the point that uh, it's, it's hard to see where a constructive relationship between those two blocks can go from here. Uh, and this is a particular shame in light of COP27 coming up later this year. So I wanted to ask your thoughts on that particular dynamic. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I think it's, it's, did you have a, oh no, oh, I saw your hand back up. Yeah. <laughs> no, I had none. Jim Engel uh, in FAS. Do you think it's possible that in some countries the effects of extreme weather and damage will become so great that the population will begin to demand more directly that their political leadership actually cooperate? Hi, this is Melissa. I'm an MPA2 at HKS. I'm um, going back on the critical minerals issue. So I went to a gold mine for the first time in Colorado this summer, and I'm really struck by the disconnect I've had um, with what I'm studying in climate, for example, at Harvard, and what rural folks on the ground are actually experiencing and working on and their awareness of climate. So I'm curious what you're hearing from both US and international governments on bringing in their full labor force in this transition. Jim Stock, he made, this is just a clarifying question. So uh, I, there's a lot of discussion sort of drawing an analogy between oil and gas uh, and our dependence on petrostates right now. And we don't want that to happen again with critical minerals and lithium and so forth. But it's, it, it's different, it's completely different because oil and gas is something that we consume in the moment to, there's a, it's a stock flow difference. This oil and gas we consume in the moment. And if we have a big, you know, increase in oil and gas prices or traditionally like problem in the Gulf or something like those now problems in uh, Russia uh, that drives up prices. We all feel it, it sort of runs through these shocks that run through the entire economy. On the other hand, if this China decided to cut off its lithium flows, all the photovoltaic panels that we have continue to work, all the wind generators that we have continue to work. It's gonna be, a, it would be a, a problem for the new flow into it, but it's it's very different than sort of choking off all of our energy resources. Um, Ivana Petrescu, I'm a, a senior fellow at the Thomas Center. And um, I think um, regarding your first hypothesis, I think the more um, we talk to the European Commission and to the people who thought about the technical details of the Green Deal and especially the incentives you put in for firms and for countries to actually go through the energy transition, you realize that they didn't have globalization at all in mind. In fact, it is quite the opposite. So I think the when, when you talk to them, the message is very clear. We don't want the photovoltaic panels to be produced in China. We want them to give you a ton of money, poor money on you in subsidies so you can produce them here in EU. Uh, we don't want you to transport too much this hydrogen, produce it there locally. We're going to give you a ton of money to produce locally hydrogen and, and have all that production in place. So it's clear from the economic incentives that they put in place that they don't want to, uh, to have this as a globalized uh, market. Um, so I think that's just an argument, an extra argument that it's, you know, it's, it's right there in our faces that actually that was the thinking, or I don't know if it was accidental, but that's what I can read from the, from the economic incentives that they put in the Just Mechanism Fund and in other type of really strong, big uh, economic packages that they, uh, they give to the EU members. Great. Let's take one here. Hello. Juan Jose Garcia Sánchez from the European Commission, International Affairs Officer, and seconded for a year of fellowship in, in Harvard. I have two questions. Thank you. There is really a lot to unpack in your, in, your, in your conference. But I was interested on the fact that in Europe, at least, we know which is the target in 20 years' time. But we are deeply concerned, and it goes a little bit in line with your intervention. We are very concerned about the playing level field now. So if, if we are the front runners, we are we are operating in a in an international context where trade relations are, are regulated by, by the WTO. 
and it's basically free trade. So how can we uh, ensure a level playing field between the states that are lagging behind, industrialized ones like China, to the, the states to a certain extent, and the ones that will run the extra mile but incur in, in, into additional cost? And then how do this influence the rising level of uh, dysfunctioning in, in international organizations? Thank you. Thank you. I, I see more hands up there, but given that we have five minutes, yeah. I'll try to respond to this and i um, happy to stick around if I am not able to talk because of the recording. So first, um, so I'm gonna go through these relatively quickly, but they're, they're great points and really relevant for what we're all facing. Uh, first on the issue of nuclear power, um, I, I think it's pretty evident from some of the decisions that were made just in the last couple of weeks that the European, I mean, Europeans have very different views on, on nuclear power, as, as you know. Um, and, uh, you know, you see certain governments actually who have not invested in a, a nuclear power program now thinking about it, looking into what could be required, some of the Eastern European countries. Um, but you have, you know, the, the, the Germany's most notably, um, delaying the retirement. You know, the Germans had three nuclear power plants that were supposed to be shut up by the end of the year. The beginning of the crisis with Russia, Europeans were saying to me, there's nothing that's gonna rock that decision. The, the sense in Europe, and I'm sure you can tell from reading about it, is one of extreme crisis. I mean, there's, there's we, we, you know, are feeling a little bit more, we're feeling a lot more relaxed. The Europeans are facing, you know, a, natural gas prices that are, you know, at various points recently have been the equivalent of $500 a barrel of oil. I mean, humongous, hu and like where it is, the big phrase that everyone in Europe was using in the last couple of weeks was that Europeans will need to choose between heating and eating um, over the course of this winter. And there's a lot of concern that that economic hardship is gonna translate into political and social unrest. I mean, that's explicit on the part of many European leaders and private elites. Um, and so, you know, what was seemed unthinkable uh, in terms of delaying the closure of nuclear power plants has now been reopened. And so I think that's true. Your point about Zaporizhia, yes. I mean, if, if something happens there, I think this this could, you know, and that, that there's a possibility there that this could um, really be another kind of Fukushima-like um, story. Okay, I have to be more quick so I can do this. Okay, in terms of reframing the energy transition, and thank you for that that thought, which I think is interesting. You know, why don't we try to reframe the energy transition as being about a um, you know a, a, a mode of independence and a dominance of sovereignty? And I would say that actually, in many respects, that's what the Russia-Ukraine crisis has interjected into the energy transition. The sense that um, the urgency is not only for climate reasons. Right now, the European the Europeans that I uh, have spoken with, I mean, there is constantly the sense of crisis around climate, but now there's this national security crisis, which has really put additional emphasis and urgency to the matter. So I, I think that's the case. One of my concerns about possibly reframing it to be about independence is, um, and this gets to the critical, or this, sorry, this gets to the, the point that was made up front about, you know, um, are we gonna do this all domestically? And that's just, you know, and I'd love, I'd love some actual thoughts or modeling or anyone who's working on this. You know, is it actually possible for the world to meet its climate goals with every country doing its own uh, industries and own clean energy industries and own clean energy supply chains? And the answer I think is quite clearly no. I don't know, you know if anybody has tried to quantitatively assess this, but if we were prioritizing getting to net zero over building domestic industries or safeguarding or uh, diminishing our um, vulnerability to geopolitical influence, we would not be recreating these industries in every country in the world. We would be trying to globalize. So I take your point exactly, and it's, it, it was one of the points I made. I made it in the context of India and China, but I think it's equally true to talk about the Europeans and now the Americans with the Inflation Reduction Act, that there's a huge component, at least in the United States, of how we're going to get some semblance of social unity around this push is by you know, creating a lot of domestic incentives. So, um, but I think there's a real tension there, obviously. Um, you know, Kyle, I think the point about indigenous populations is a good one. Um, 
Alex, you know, I think I'm going to have to talk to you offline about some of these things because I realize what time it is. Um, but let me talk about critical minerals because it came up in a few places. It's obviously something which is is very key. Um, Jason Bordoff and I are co-chairing a, a task force on this for the Aspen Institute. Um, you know, Jim, your point about stock versus flow. This is obviously you know, this is a very important point, and um, I've tried to think a lot about it. I'd love to talk to you in more detail about it. I think it's true. This is not the same thing as oil. Um, that let's just say China is the one that actually ends up deciding it's not going to export a lot of these rare earths or the reprocess critical minerals or whatever country might do it. Um, it couldn't shut down the American economy or the European economy in the way maybe an oil embargo would have. But that's not to say it doesn't actually carry some real economic threat um, or doesn't create real powers of coercion. So, and the best way to think about this, unless someone comes up with something better, is just think about what's happened with supply chains right now. Um, that wasn't geopolitically inspired, but it's still having a major impact on our economy. And so it's a different kind of tool, but it's not without, you know, without some value. Um, and you know, as I've spoken with more and more people about like, what does it mean for China to have control over these critical minerals, both in terms of the mining, but also in terms of the processing. Um, you know, if you talk to people at big American car makers, they said, well, it could kind of shut down our industry, right? So that's, again, it's not, you know, not creating, lurching us into a depression, but that's not a minor thing for the American economy. There's also the, the possibility that a country would leverage their dominance in critical mineral in a way that's not an embargo. That simply it could say, well, if you want to use these materials, you have to build your cars in our country. You know, there, there's, there's a, a variety of ways in which the disproportionate dominance of, of critical minerals, mining and processing in a very few countries in the world currently um, could have geopolitical but you're right, they're not exactly the same as, as oil and gas. Um, I realize it's 115. To the point about mobilization, uh, or you know, is there a, a possibility that populations will demand more action, more cooperative action? I'm counting on it. Like I'm counting on it, that actually the world we see today is not as intense as the world we're gonna see in 10 years time. And that I think, so when I think about the geopolitics of it, I think you know it seems kind of crazy to imagine that one country would sanction another country for not bringing down its emissions in 10 years time. That might be true. Like we might be in a world where that actually doesn't seem crazy because the the threat of not taking action to decarbon or not taking action to decarbonize may be perceived as a threat. So I do think we're 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 not in a static environment, and so that will um, create new constraints, but also new opportunities as well. Um, let's see what else. Uh, anyways, many other questions. I'm a few minutes over. Um, I'm going to stick around in case anybody has time and want to say hello. But if you have a thought or a question that I haven't answered, um, feel free to come visit me during my office hours. I'd love to talk to you. And thanks for the opportunity. And thank you, Jeff. Great. Thank you, Megan. So a quick reminder, we'll meet again uh, 12 p.m. Monday next week. I'll give a talk about how to learn how to build back better. One of what will be a number of talks we'll have on the Inflation Reduction Act this semester. Also, I'll note that we've added one more talk for the end of the semester, the last Monday, November 28th. We'll have FERC Chairman Rich Glick joining us, telling us how we're going to redo our power markets and transmission and other fun things in order to develop, uh, deliver on the decarbonization goals that we will be talking about this semester. Megan and Jim, thank you again so much. That was a great start to the semester. Thank you. <laughs>